Hi, everyone. It's so good to be here. And we are super lucky to have these really dynamic uh, administration officials, who I'm just going to call Julie and Polly, because you have long handles. So I hope that's OK. Um, so yeah, this is a really interesting time, obviously, in economic development, um, because a, a, a few industries in particular are being supercharged with a lot of federal investment. And there is an appropriate focus, as Mary Alice outlined on making sure those jobs are decent. And um, you know, in the past, there has been a focus in federal contracting on the lowest bid wins, because that's an efficient way to spend our government dollars. And I think changing that paradigm is, um, is a real challenge. And I think it's a sort of generational commitment um, that's been underway for many years. So um, I first just thought I would start out broad and ask you guys, since your roles are different, um, how do you see your role in this larger project of trying to make sure jobs in general, or specifically those supported by federal dollars, are family sustaining, with, you know, infused with worker power, well paid, have, with long term retirement security, all the things we've talked about? Maybe I'll let the MacArthur genius okay. uh, kick <laughs> us off here. I'm hang on her every word. Now, Polly can make fun of me because we've been working together. Um, closely <laughs> since we came into this administration together. Um, but thank you so much for the question. Thank you for having me. It's so good to be here um, with my friends at New America and also um, Deputy Secretary Trottenberg. And I, so uh, let me say a couple of things. One is that, you know, we keep talking about this like unprecedented level of federal investment. Um, and just to really like hit home what we're talking about. Um, the amount of investment that we are currently making in infrastructure, just in you know, roads and bridges and highways, is more than uh, what was invested in uh, during the Eisenhower administration when the national highway system was built. Um, the amount that we are investing in innovation right, in, uh, through like, chips uh, and science is more than the investments that were made during President Kennedy's administration when we sent a man to the moon. And the amount that we're investing now in just you know, climate, there's really no comparison to any prior administration. So it really is uh, an incredible time, I think an incredibly exciting time, to think about how federal investment can really shape private, uh, you know, uh, you know, other local city, state, um, and community uh, opportunities. Um, for us at the Department of Labor, um, you know, we really see ourselves as partners to those to our sister agencies who are charged with putting out that funding, um, and specifically on a couple of fronts. One is on what's already been talked about today is job quality, right? This is a moment in which, um, I mean, it's the right thing to do at any time, but, you know, and it's the right thing to do sort of by the things that, that, that you mentioned, right? Sometimes, you know, history tells us the lowest bid is not always the, in the long run, the lowest cost, right? It's not always the best investment. And so really thinking about how good jobs are part of building this future that we want is, you know, I think this is an opportunity for that. It's also a moment in which workers are, you know, we've seen a, a shift in how workers, uh, in worker power, right? We've seen, um, you know, people talk about the great resignation, but the reality is that more people have been, there have been more hires than there have been resignations yeah, in the last couple of years, which means that people are really leaving bad jobs for better jobs um, and leaving better jobs for even better jobs. So this is a moment which workers are you know, really demanding their seat at the table. They're organizing in unprecedented ways. And so job quality becomes a greater imperative because of that. So we view our role as helping to support our sister agencies in um, having good job standards attached to federal funding. Again, recognize that federal funding can really drive behavior. Um, that's why our secretary, Secretary Walsh, launched the Good Jobs Initiative, which has MOUs with various agencies. We can talk about that a little bit more today. But the other piece is our work to make sure that these good jobs that are created um, are distributed in a way that advances equity, equitable outcomes, that includes communities that have been for so long excluded, even in the best of times. And so um, really looking at um, how we you know, use this moment um, not just to advance policy goals, not just to create good jobs, but to really combat systemic racism and other forms of exclusion. Um, because a lot of these jobs that are being created have not been equitably um, available to all communities. So really thinking about how we do that in, in a sustained way is very exciting for us. Well, let me just follow on. And, and, and Mary Alice, New America, thanks for having us here today. It's great to be here with, uh, with my colleague Julie and, and Lydia from the New York Times. Thank you. Thanks to all the journalists who are doing amazing work in these 
challenging political times. Um, I think just to underscore a bit of what Julie's talking about, and particularly I'll speak about it from the transportation context. I think, you know, as a sector, transportation is one of the most highly unionized and comes sort of comes to the table even before the big infrastructure bill with some statutory labor protections, including a couple that are very well known, prevailing wage and Davis Bacon, which you know, already set sort of a foundational stage in, in terms of wages and working closely with the unionized sector in transit. So, you know, we start off luckily in a place where we have a lot of good jobs and the infrastructure bill has given us the opportunity to expand, you know, sort of the transportation workforce, both internally at USDOT for starters and then obviously in transportation agencies all over the country as well as in private construction firms, et cetera. You know, our focus has particularly been, as this extraordinary set of opportunities arises, exactly what Julie is talking about. How do we make sure that we don't miss this moment to get to all the communities that have not been well served in transportation in terms of employment opportunities, training opportunities, and also on the procurement side, in procurement and wealth building opportunities. And that's where I think our partnership um, with DOL and our two secretaries, Buttigieg and Walsh, but also particularly Julie, because she has been such a leader in this field for so many years of thinking through, we've got the money, we have at least on the transportation side a strong statutory framework, but how do we now sort of overcome, you know, generations of barriers to women, to people of color from getting into those high paid jobs, those union jobs, and it has been, I think, one of the most exciting parts of our partnership to really dig in on that question and tackle it in a real kind of multi-dimensional way from looking at pre-apprentice training, to looking at how the hiring is happening, to looking at all the ways that we can, in, within our statutory authorities, use our grant-making process to nudge along more diverse workforces, local hiring, a lot of the practices that we think will move the needle. And, and I would just say one thing, um, Lydia, I think the good news is, and look, I, I, on the New York City side, was involved in a lot of procurements and this question about lowest bid and value for money. and. I think there is now a growing transition into recognizing that really good project delivery is about a lot of different value propositions, including what you do to train your local workforce. So I, I'm encouraged that that, I think, is now starting to become, and we're seeing that in places all over the country and not just sort of, you know, oh, the big cities of California, but places you might not expect it, a recognition, particularly with this level of transformative funding we got to do more in the end than just get a bunch of projects at the lowest possible cost. We want to lift up communities and bring a whole new generation of diverse workers into the transportation field. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good to have a concrete conversation about what this actually looks like. And I'm sure there's lots of local government officials listening and wondering, you know, how do I craft these proposals and everything. So tell me more um, from both of your guys' ends of this, what it actually looks like. Are you doing requirements? Is it um, just sort of nudges? Is it like a suggestion that maybe we'll look upon this favorably? Um, is it a point system? How are these principles being infused into the leverage of federal dollars? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack. Yeah. And then and mm -hmm. it, it varies a lot from program to program. Um, you know, both the statutory requirements, the le you know, sort of the legislative history and, and how we do this. But I'll give a couple of very affirmative um, examples that I think are exciting. Uh, we have a program at our Federal Transit Administration which is called Low and No Emissions Program. And it's to give grants, particularly now we're really focused on converting the nation's bus fleet from diesel to electric. It's going to have huge environmental benefits. But as part of that program, the grant recipients are allowed to take a proportion of those funds and use them to work with their workforce to train them in these new type of vehicles. And that's something we're partnering with DOL on. So there it's a very affirmative statutory part of the program with dollars set aside. We have another program which is for um, rail grants. The program's called CRISI. And there we are allowed to give affirmative grants for workforce development. We just gave an $8 million grant to Amtrak to work on a whole new training and apprenticeship program for rail workers. In our other programs, it very much runs the gamut, but in a lot of the discretionary grant programs, we've been able to put in language where essentially we're talking about, you know, again, training, project labor agreements, a bunch of good labor practices, um, both to grow and diversify the workforce and to ensure that they have appropriate labor protections. And we can look at that as a way to sort of give them extra, 
you know, basically extra credit in the grant applications. And, and I'm happy to say, look, we're sort of the first year in on doing some of these grant programs with some of that language. And I, I think we got a great response. We probably have seen, you know, whereas in previous years we might have just a handful of grantees that had written in talking about what they were going to do on the labor front, we're now seeing probably close to a third doing that. And I think in coming years we're going to see a lot more. So we're really excited. Um, about the progress there, it's you know, it it it's a it's a learning experience for all of us. But you know, and again, I think we've seen. And I know Julie can talk about this, you know what's been exciting is we've seen examples of communities in really diverse places. Louisville, Kentucky, is doing an incredible project, working with their local community. So you know, not just in the the places you might expect to see it. Yeah. Well, oh, I'll just build on that, Polly, because I I always cite to your point that um, in including language in your you know, notices of funding opportunities, you have seen some shift in, uh, in the applications that you get. And again, that is the power of leveraging federal investments to um, reflect the values of this administration, right? And this president has been very, very clear that building an economy that's centered on the well-being of workers, that is about expanding good union jobs, is, is very much how we build a, you know, how we build back and how we, um, uh, you know, create a, a, not just a, strong recovered economy, but a, but a resilient one. Um, I think the other thing I'll just add to that is that the other thing that we've done in addition to um, working with Polly and our other, um, uh, uh, you know, other, other departments um, putting out federal funding in terms of what kind of language can be included in grants is really trying to give concrete examples of what this really looks like on the ground. Right? The other good news, in addition to everything that Polly said, which I agree with, is that we don't have to invent a lot of this stuff out of whole cloth. Like there are examples of what we're talking about, right? Sector-based labor management partnerships with true worker voice that's focused on reaching out to communities that would not otherwise get the jobs, much less get into the training programs. There's examples of that, and we have an opportunity now. You know, we, we don't need to do it all at the federal government level, right? We should. You know, reward, incentivize that kind of uh, good work that's happened on the ground. So, as another example of you know, place that people might not expect, um, you know, there's been really good work um, done by Jobs to Move America, along with a company called New Flyer, where they basically uh, entered into a community benefits agreement to make sure to hire folks from the local community to build electric buses. I mean, so how do we? Uh, you know, kind of reward and incentivize that kind of behavior so that it's scaled across the entire economy is really exciting. So presenting specific examples of, of things that are working, connecting people so that, you know, they can learn from one another is something that we've spent a lot of time doing. We did a good job summit, which Polly, you know, um, very kindly came to speak at, where we brought together folks working on the ground at cities, in states, right, between unions and employers. Um, and, you know, and, and, and uh, intermediaries and, and sector leaders to talk about what they're doing. And I think sharing those kinds of examples is a key part of, um, of how we get where we want to be. So I hear a lot of reward, incentivize, showcase, um, provide extra grants if you do this thing, like, but not a lot of requiring, mandating, you know, et cetera. And I'm wondering if there's a hesitation to do that, if there's a trade-off between getting procurement contracts out the door um, in a timely fashion and making sure that all these good things are part of them? Well, I just think, I think you have to look at carefully for, for each agency at what we're allowed to do statutorily. I mean, that's usually the limiting factor here. And again, as I sort of said at the outset, you know, we have a couple of long-standing statutory tools in the transportation sector. I mean, we have prevailing wage. If you're using federal dollars on a project, you have to pay a prevailing wage, which is, you know, typically a very good wage in terms of raising a family and, and having a middle class lifestyle. Ditto um, Davis Bacon, ditto another provision we have, 13C, which affects how we work with Department of Labor on, uh, w with transit workers. So those are very strong statutory foundations. Beyond that, I think you have to be, again, as a federal agency, use every tool in your disposal, but you have to be somewhat careful about exceeding your statutory mandate. And I think, you know, one thing some of your audience may have seen something we're very, you know, we're, we're proud of, but has proved controversial is our, our Federal Highway Administration put out actually an internal memo talking about what particularly was the vision for formula dollars, where we as an agency have sort of far less discretion. Talking about the workforce pieces, climate pieces, you name it, and it's, it's proved controversial. You know, with real pushback on Capitol Hill, you know, accusing us of potentially overstepping our statutory uh, you know, authority. So I think you have to find that sweet spot. And I, I think one thing I think we're proud of being in this administration, 
I think we've leaned in really hard wherever we can to try and really make the case and set up a, you know, a structure that's going to incentivize what we're all talking about here today, which is you know, a diverse, well-trained workforce that's working on these infrastructure projects and, and hopefully you know, starting a whole new set of career paths for folks. As well as, again, I want to just hit up also on the procurement side, doing a lot to up our DBE goals and making sure that women-owned and minority-owned firms really get a piece of the contracting work. And, can create that generational wealth. So I would say I think we, we, we push as far as we can given our statutory authorities, but Congress also obviously has a say in how these programs are designed and implemented. Mm -hmm. Anything to add on that, Julie? No, I mean, I think that's right. You know, for us at the Department of Labor, we, um, we didn't get any of the funding in terms of, you know, the, 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 these bills. And so our work has really been in support. I think, you know, Polly's absolutely right that there are places where um, there are statutory requirements like prevailing wage, which we think are very, very important and really invaluable. And then there's other places where, um, you know, the, the, the nudge, the incentivize. Um, and then, like I said, there's the even soft, like, you know, how do we demonstrate what is possible and demonstrate that it's actually really good in communities so that even where it's voluntary, more, more folks are likely to do it, right? I think it's clear that people are not going to be able to enjoy the safe roads and new bridges and you know, infrastructure in this administration is broader than roads and bridges, right? The, 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 the broadband and the clean water flowing from your pipes if you don't have the economic security that comes with a good job. And so recognizing that that is ultimately what's best for, you know, to make the investments go as far as they can, you know, we're, we're hopeful that um, if we show how it can be done, that there will be more, that, that, you know, that it'll be done at scale mm -hmm. and it'll be, uh, looking back like 10 years from now, we will say that, you know, um, it didn't happen just because we required it, but it did happen because it was the right thing to do and we made it easy to do. Yeah. So, I mean, oh, um, well taken that there are statutory limits and that Davis-Bacon um, and the Service Contract Act are super powerful and have made these jobs, better jobs over the years. And, and not to... And, and make the transportation sector the, one of the most unionized sectors in the economy. I mean, we start off from a, a place where, you know, more to do, but where transportation jobs are pretty traditionally unionized and therefore good wages, good benefits, you know, good lifelong training. Right. I, well, let me do a slight tangent question before getting to the real other question. But um, those statutes do tend to, um, in my experience, um, fall apart a little bit on when it, things get to like contracting and subcontracting and enforcement and making sure that everybody truly is um, enjoying the benefits of those laws, um, or sometimes it, they don't totally extend to like concessionaires, you know, folks who work at the Pentagon and at the McDonald's inside. Um, so, are are you doing something you can to make sure that even those laws benefit as many people so, whose wages are ultimately paid by federal tax dollars as you can? Well, I think you're you're sort of getting into a bigger question here, and one that I think is a really good one, and is increasingly I think becoming a campaign. I know Unite Now and, and and other unions around the country have been looking at, you know, one place they've been looking that we've been working with them on is what's happening at airports, which is exactly that question, which is a lot of airports get a lot of federal grants. Um, you know, typically, you know, there'll be an airport operator that is maybe a public authority, maybe a private authority, and then is contracting out a certain amount of airport. Uh, you know, a certain amount of airport concessions and other things, and looking at the potential nexus there. You know, again, you, ha you have to look a bit, at least for DOT, at the, you know, sort of our statutory authorities. Um, you know, where an entity is a direct recipient of federal dollars, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of strings we can pull where, um, you know, they're using their dollars for one thing and then they have contracting in another area. It, there's not always the same nexus, but listen, I think we, we, Intellectually, we totally get where those campaigns are coming from, and we want to see if there are ways that we can make progress there. I mean, I think ideally, when an entity or an ecosystem is getting a lot of federal dollars, we should figure out a way to make sure that all the jobs that are involved there, um, you know, are getting the right, you know, the right set of wages, benefits, etc. But you know, statutorily, the further removed the dollars sort of get from what an agency is directly given out, the less you have necessarily potentially in. Uh, you know, the kind of hooks that you have when the dollars are direct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's just such an important point, and so I just want to thank you for raising it. You know, I think as much as we um, celebrate the historic investments and the good things that are being done, it's important to take a really clear-eyed view about the, you know, very real struggles of working people across our economy and 
part of it due to the things that you've talked about, right? Subcontracting, which for decades has been used as a way to insulate those at the top of the chain from responsibility for workers at the end of that chain. Now, you know, this president has taken steps to try to address that too, right? Through executive orders, um, you know, $15 minimum wage across the entire, you know, um, uh, for all, all federal contractors. Um, you know, misclassification is another big one, right? Which is a part of this where for a very long time, not just individual employers, but whole industries have made it a business model to basically skirt a century of labor laws by calling people who should be employees independent contractors. And so we have just um, uh, issued um, a proposed rule to try to reverse the last administration's weakening of, uh, of, of, of um, rules about independent contracting. Um, and you know, then that requires enforcement. So it's just a really, it's just an important reminder of the, of, of the many challenges um, in the workplace and the importance of a whole bunch of different pieces, right? Besides, you know, just the, the sort of federal investments, we need, we, we need strong labor laws, we need enforcement of those labor laws, and we need to, you know, we, we, you know it's, it, we, we have a president who's been very clear that workers organizing and, and the freedom to organize is a really, really important part of that equation. You're not going to make a pitch for extra appropriations to get this all done. That was like a wide open. Uh, I can't <laughs> remember what I'm allowed to do, so I'm not going to okay. do that. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, this might, okay, just at the risk of asking you to do something else you're not allowed to do. Um, so, I mean, we've established there's limitations on what you can do. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know, like, what would be the obvious statutory changes to allow you to make these dollars work harder for people? I mean, I. I I want to, and I think Julie will have a lot of thoughts on that. I'll, I'll just give sort of one thought. I mean, we do speak about the big infrastructure pillar. It was the bipartisan infrastructure law. And look, I'm, I'm super proud to be part of an administration. I say this about President Biden. He was a legislator. And if you look at what we have accomplished legislatively in the past year and a half, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, we have done a, you know, a fantastic list of legislative accomplishments, and some of them bipartisan, which he's proud of. So I think, you know, I can answer that question, but I also want to say, you know, he is a, he is a, he is a president who is very much grounded in, you know, sort of working with the Congress and getting the best we can. So I think, you know, politically, just to hit on something Julie said, I think one thing that we're finding exciting here is that what we're doing on the ground, I think, is sort of opening up minds and, and winning over some hearts. And, you know, I, I have no doubt that our administration will probably be back again with Congress next year trying to perhaps gain more ground on some of these issues. But I want to be careful. I don't know that I want to say exactly what the agenda would be, but I do think. I know this president and our administration were fiercely committed to continuing to make advancements on this, and we'll see what the legislative landscape looks like next year. But I, I have a hunch, and I'm sure Julie has some thoughts on this. You know, we will be coming back over and over again legislatively. Well, I'm going to shift a little bit, and then please correct me if, if I should answer the question more directly. But one of the things that um, I say a lot inside the Department of Labor is, what are we doing to unleash our full power? Um, the full power we've already been given, right? The full power that we've been given legislatively, um, budgetarily, um, and 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 through other and through other rules, right? I think oftentimes in government there's a sense that we have to have new things in order to do more. And while there, that is certainly true, and I agree again with everything that Polly said, there's also a tremendous amount of work that can be done within government agencies to just unleash the full power that we've already been given. So. As an example, right, part of the whole conversation about workforce is around the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, or WIOA, right, which is, you know, billions of dollars, uh, you know, much of it in formula grants to states ar around building a workforce, right, trying to answer this question that is all around us, right, how do we make sure we have the workers to do the things that we want to do? And again, our answer is you make them good jobs and you focus on equity and you make, you know, make sure that you are tapping into the full talent of the American workforce. But part of that is also making sure that there's innovation and bold innovation going on within the workforce world. So we've been really, you know, you know, like leaning into how do we make sure that WIOA is utilized in the full creative way that it can be used to support some of these we're talking about, sector-based labor management partnerships with job quality and equity at their center. Um, and so we, we, we have launched a, a campaign that's called Yes, WIOA Can 
that is meant to make it clear to um, everyone in the WIOA world that there's lots of myths and restrictions that have come up around WIOA that are, that are myths, and how do we break those down so that we are, again, utilizing the resources that are already there. I love uh, weird acronym puns. That's <laughs> great. Um, so, um, well, so uh, we, the, the previous discussion with um, Mayor Norton talked a lot about the importance of care uh, and care jobs, care as a enabler of people doing jobs. Um, you know, the Build Back original Build Back Better plan had a lot of money for that. That was not did not make it into final version. Um, I know that. These are not people you employ, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Trottenberg, but I'm just wondering to both of you, like, um, do you think the current flight of federal investments can be kind of leveraged to try to lift up those professions as well, um, even though right now they directly pay for hard infrastructure? Right. Well, so I, you know, I think I can say this on behalf of the entire administration, right? Um, you know, President Biden, Vice President Harris, we're very clear that care is infrastructure, and that you know, as as you said, as you know, my friend Ijin Poo at the National Domestic Workers Alliance says all the time, it is the the work that makes all of the work possible. And so, the you know the the, the ambitions in Build Back Better around making sure that we truly invest that in infrastructure, the same way we invest in other infrastructure, uh, was really broad. And unfortunately, um, uh, you know, Congress didn't pass it. Um, so. You know, for us, that has meant that we have shifted to try to find other ways of utilizing powers that we have to make sure that there is an investment in care workers, that we, you know, as we look at who's getting jobs, like this whole conversation about, you know, making sure that there are um, women, people of color in these good jobs that we're making does require some amount of making sure that there's a care infrastructure so that people can go to work, right? And that's partly why in all these workforce um, d development, you know, um, uh, you know, training partnerships that we care about. We're also interested in, in investments in support um, systems, right? F funding for things like care, like um, transportation and, you know, uh, tools, other things that, that, you know, are sort of work adjacent things that, that, that make work possible. And so we are, we've been trying to really look at ways to do that. Um, we are utilizing, you know, and encouraging um, investments of WIOA dollars and others into care, um, uh, care training programs that will both, again, make sure that we meet the need for care and elevate those care jobs. Um, and so there's, you know, frankly, just a lot more work that needs to be done there. And we are, um, you know, we're, we're deeply aware of it and looking at creative ways to, um, certainly one of the other things is, you know, coming from California and seeing what local and state entities are doing in creative ways to lean into the need for a strong air care infrastructure. I think there's also, again, you know, we don't believe that the federal government should do it all, need to do it all, or, sh or you know, or, or can do it all. And so figuring out how we support creative work on the local level um, in, in this space is also something that's exciting for us. Got it. You know, like daycare centers on, you know, job sites, maybe. I'm just thinking creatively. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take questions soon so people start thinking. Um, but in the meantime, to give you a chance to think about 10 minutes, okay. Um, so, you know, there's, as we've talked about, a ton of dollars coming through the pipeline. Um, but if I'm an 18 year old and I'm like answering the call to go build bridges and bike lanes, et cetera, um, what confidence could you give me that these jobs will be around after this cycle of investments, like that that will be sustained, that, that we will be entering a, you know, generations long boom in infrastructure spending, because that's, that's a fear I would have. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that fear would be very misplaced. We, in transportation, we actually have an aging workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so even, even before we got this big influx of infrastructure dollars, I would say to all the young people I came across, this is a great field to get into. And again, for some of the reasons we're talking about here, it is actually, relatively speaking, a highly, uh, you know, relatively highly paid and unionized sector with, you know, look, I love transportation. I also just think it, it is a great field to get into. And you mentioned some of the, you know, if you, if you care about your city and you want to see bike lanes or, you know, you, you, you want to do something about the aerospace industry, it, it offers a lot of opportunities for a really diverse set of careers. And, um, I think it is a field that will always, always, always need talent, particularly engineers. Um, you know, it's interesting. I issue uh, 
you know, as noted, I, I ran New York City DOT for, for seven years and relied heavily on an amazing set of engineers, a lot of whom came from other countries. Um, you know, because even in the U.S. as we train a lot of engineers, not nearly enough. Uh, so, you know, I am not worried that once, you know, once we're through these dollars that the field is going to contract. One, I think these dollars will play out over many years, too. I think if we do our jobs right, and I, I hope we will, um, you know, we're going to change the paradigm here a bit, and there will always be a continued interest, I think, in a more robust level of infrastructure investment in this country. So please, it's a great field to get into, and one, one pitch I always make, go on USA Jobs right now, and you can see there's a special link that, that connects to the, to the infrastructure bill with all kinds of job opportunities. Um, I, you know, one joke I, I like to make uh, at USDOT right now, if you've ever thought about coming to the federal government, if you've ever thought about coming to, to USDOT, with a president uh, and a vice president who love and care about infrastructure, some great secretaries, some great cabinet secretaries in our administration, and, and all these new dollars and programs. There's never going to be a better time than right now. Well, uh, can, I, can I just build on yeah. what Polly said, just to expand that to also, right, like, you know, energy uh, policy, you know, manufacturing. I just came, you know, this morning there was a meeting at the White House around our, like, you know, our, what's our industrial strategy around advanced manufacturing? And we're not talking in terms of, like, you know, six month, year long, or couple year strategies. We are talking about investments that are going to last for, you know, decades and, you know, create infrastructure that's gonna to need to be updated and maintained. And so I think that, you know, we are looking at jobs not, that are gonna shift the entire way that we build our economy, not just, uh, you know, temporary um, projects for the moment. New America panels can get you jobs. Um, <laughs> so. Questions from the audience, please step up. We have a microphone. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for the both of you for being here. Uh, Shailen Jotishi from New America. Um, my question is for uh, you, Deputy Secretary Sue. Uh, I love this blog name, uh, Yes, We Owe a Can. I actually Googled the blog while I was just uh, on my computer. Definitely recommend folks online check it out. My question is actually about that. Um, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit, not to give away the secret sauce of the series, but what are some of the myths around WIOA that you'd like the public to know about and myths you'd like to see dispelled? Thank you very much. Oh, I really, really appreciate that question. I also just want to give some credit where it's due. So the person who came up with the name is actually in the room, and it's my colleague Monica Vereen, who's with our, um, our Office of Public um, a is the, <laughs> um, um, but uh, so I, I really do appreciate that question. And it's not meant to be a secret sauce. The whole purpose of a campaign is to make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, but I'll give a couple examples, right? One is just very much in line with everything we've talked about here today. I, I think that, you know, um, one, one of the things I, I, I like to say is that, you know, this is not your father's workforce development system. It's not your grandfather's workforce development system. It's not a system where, for a long time, the incentive was just to train as many people as possible, um, not necessarily connected to jobs, and not certainly not connected to job quality, right? And so what we measure in the workforce system is what's going to get done. And if we do better at measuring what kinds of jobs people got into, um, how long that job was, uh, you know, how, what, was it a career? Um, what are the intergenerational impacts of, of our investments? I think that it upends the way we thought about workforce, uh, workforce investment. Um, another reason you know, we came up with this campaign is that in my travels as Deputy Secretary, but also in my you know, time in California, I think there are, there are just myths. People you know, sort of handcuff themselves about what is possible within WIOA. You know, are we allowed to prioritize equity? Are we allowed to say that we want to measure how many black, brown, uh, API, LGBTQ, uh, you know, workers with disabilities came through these programs. And so wanting to make sure that, that again, the, the programs reflect the priorities that we have. One of the things that we found when we first came in and did a deep dive on equity is that um, systematically, African American um, sort of graduates of WIOA funded training programs end up in jobs where they are getting paid less than their white counterparts. So the, the, the system has to correct that, right? That, that, is, that is reinforcing systemic barriers. It's also it, not the purpose of the program. And so in order for us to be clear-eyed and, 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 and smart about how we do better, 
um, we have to be we have to take a look at what what what's possible and we all what we're what we're allowed to measure what we're allowed to change and so those are some of the examples but there will be more to come well, I'm with CompTIA the computer trade industry association this is a question for deputy secretary Chalkenberg. I think this historic investment this interesting time we're in is is also such a huge opportunity to look at women in jobs. And the sectors we've been speaking to, infrastructure, transportation, tech, construction, tend to be male dominated. And when we look at the jobs and look at the data, thank you, Deputy Secretary Sue, for queuing this up, we do see such a disparity in a category that we at CompTIA have been trying to shift for a long time to get women into tech. What are some of the best practices you've seen to incorporate solutions that we can use to lift that issue as well? Thank you. Th thank you for that great question. And they don't tend to be male dominated. They are male dominated. Um, and it just an interesting little statistic. So I uh, ran New York City DOT for seven years. I was at US DOT, as was said, in the Obama administration and now in the Biden administration. Both agencies, the gender breakdown is 75% male, 25% female. So federal and local, and it's been that way for over a decade, despite a lot of efforts, I think, to sort of try and change that gender balance. So just to sort of underscore, and in the, if, if you look at particular sectors, maritime, very few women, aviation, very few women. Transit, actually, probably the, one of the transportation sectors where you see a much more even gender balance. So these are long-standing challenges, and I've, I've, in the course of my career, you know, tried to work, work at them both at the local and the federal level. And, you know, since you're sort of asking for best practices, I'll, I'll give a couple thoughts on it. Um, you know, there, there is no question that I think at the federal level, there's a lot we can do to, you know, as you're saying, nudge, incentivize, and, you know, some of the work that we've been doing and working with, with Julie and DOL has been really exciting. It, it is somewhat bespoke work, you know, to get sort of folks that don't see themselves in particular prof professions into those professions can take, you know, really aggressive and thoughtful recruiting, training, and working to make sure that the organizations and the companies in questions have, you know, that welcoming, inclusive culture that's going to keep those employees. And, you know, you, you mentioned sort of the care economy. I mean, this isn't a transportation-specific thing, but it is also true that obviously um, women for whom still, you know, they are taking on more of the burden of childcare or caring for, for aging parents, that can particularly be challenging in fields that have, you know, sort of 24-7 potential schedules. If you're driving a train or if you are driving a bus or you want to be an air traffic controller, you know, there's certain parts of the transportation sector that are very operational. And that can be, you know, that can be, you know, and, and, and not much opportunities as we now know for things like remote work. You know, 40% of the jobs at USDOT are not remote work. They are operational. So, you know, I think there are things we're trying to incentivize at the federal level. I can tell you at the local level it's sort of the same. At the local level, you know, in my time as Transportation Commissioner, we worked really closely with the local building trades council, with the contracting firms with our own city hiring process and tried to, you know, chip away at this issue everywhere we went. I think we've made some progress, but the progress has been still a lot slower than I certainly would like it to be. Um, you know, I also do a lot of work with an important group in transportation, WTS, which is the Women's Transportation Seminar, which is kind of the leading, you know, women in transportation advocacy group. Um, and they do, they have, they have chapters all over the country, and they are famous. You, you may remember back in the campaign, there was the famous talk of kind of for, for when uh, um, Mitt Romney was governor in Massachusetts and then later presidential campaign that he was given binders full of women. They came from the local WTS chapter uh, in, the, in Massachusetts. But that's, that's part of the process, is that networking, is that supporting and promoting of women in the field. Um, so I think it's all of those practices, but, but I'll admit we've got a long way to go. We are, we are not there yet. Yeah, I mean, can I just build on that really quickly? First, to say thank you, right? For I, th I do think the, again, the work that happens at, completely outside of what the federal government is doing is so key because uh, you know we, we are all going to be needed to get this done. But a couple of really concrete examples is um, 
without in any way, um, uh, you know, um, I feel like I should let it sit, the comment that we have a long way to go, because that's really, really, really important. Um, but in the spirit of there are things happening, right? And like, is this a moment where we could really see big shifts because of the investments that we made, but also because of work on the ground? Is um, a, a, a group called Chicago Women in Trades. Um, are you all here in the room? Oh. Who've been doing incredible work. <laughs> so let me just put the camera on you and acknowledge the amazing work that you all are doing to basically transform you know, women in the infrastructure workforce. And, and there's a model um, that, that you all have done so successfully. And we are supportive of your efforts to expand your technical assistance to 10 other states to try to, 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 try to you know, expand um, your impact. So I'm, I'm so glad you're here and we're so proud to support you. And then just another piece in terms of like the, the partnerships between um, organizations, and this is you know, back to um, Polly's roots, but I know that the DOT gave a $110 million award to the Hunts Point Terminal Produce Market Intermodal Facility in New York City. And that is um, improving not only the largest food distribution center in the country, but will create 1,000 new jobs. It has PLAs, as Polly has already mentioned, um, so much of their funding does. But 10% of their apprenticeship slots, slots are actually reserved for public housing residents, and 15% are reserved for women trained through an organization called Non-Traditional Employment for Women, or NEW. NEW is also funded by the Department of Labor as part of our grants to bring women into non-traditional uh, occupations. So there's a lot of work that we're trying to do across um, organizations, across agencies, to, to, to address this issue. But there's much more work that we need to do, for sure. Um, well, let's one more, last question. Hi, thanks. Um, so October is, as you know, National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month. Um, so my question, as you know, also this po is a population that faces ma major barriers to employment, has one of the highest rates of unemployment and joblessness. Just curious to know if you, what you're doing to support this population of disabled workers, but also what's working out there that you're seeing. Thank you. So I'll just mention, again, the Department of Labor, we have a, 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 an agency called ODEP, the Office of Disability Employment um, Policy. And that work, that, that work is um, focused, you know, we've been celebrating NDEAM um, all month, but very much about making sure that everything we're talking about when we talk about equity includes workers with disabilities. Uh, training programs, how we measure equity, um, hiring within the federal government. Uh, so th th there's just, you know, no question that that's, you know, a community that's been left behind also when we talk about communities that have been left behind and where there's tremendous talent that we should draw from for all the building that we're doing now. So let me just add to that and um, sort of dovetailing with everything Julie said and we're, we're cl working closely with DOL, we have our own very robust programs to try and get more people with disabilities into the workforce and, and led by someone, if some of you don't know him, Kelly Buckland, who's our disability advisor DOT, who's phenomenal if you don't know him get to know him. But I think another piece of it that we're also putting a big focus on, of course, is access. That has been one of the real barriers for people with disabilities to be fully integrated into educational system. So, so we are very focused. One nice thing from the infrastructure bill, it gave us incredible new funding to make mass transit systems all around the country fully ADA, funding for Amtrak to make all their stations fully ADA compliant. Um, so we are looking for ways not only to help do the training and the recruitment, but also to make sure once you've got the jobs, that as persons with disabilities, you can access them. And that, I, again, another reason I'm so excited about um, the infrastructure bill. We've never had those kinds of dollars, you know, specifically devoted to, you know, particularly fixing mass transit systems, where you know it, it's a multi-multi-billion dollar endeavor to retrofit a lot of old transit systems. I will also just say, just another thing we're proud of at DOT, we're also very focused on the question of access in the aviation sector been a long-standing issue with the disability community. Um, you know, how, how the treatment they get at airports, the treatment they get at airlines, what happens with their wheelchairs, lavatories on board. So we're very focused on rulemakings on all those issues and have put out a whole uh, people with disabilities bill of rights, basically, for, for air travel. So thank you for that question. Really focused on those issues. They're super important. Didn't even realize that about the infrastructure bill. Um, you can comply with the law now. Uh, so Got to wrap it up. Thank you so much. This was excellent. I think we all learned a lot. Um, and I will, we, will, we will exit the stage. Thank you, New America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>